Hey, that's pretty bad. Raptors lose 140 to 123. The last home game of the season. You know, I'm not going to see these guys until exit interviews on what, like Monday. The Raptors, a 17 point loss without Emmanuel quickly, without Scotty, without Jakob. I mean, this was probably to be expected. The Pacers, while they have kind of like been coughing and they've been they've had a tough time of things lately relative to let's say their talent level they don't play a bunch of defense the post or the after pascal trade pacers have not popped off the way that they might have wanted to and a lot of that is to do with like tyrese halberton went from being a guy who shot like 10 threes a game on like 44 percent to being a guy who shot like seven a game on like 28 percent. it's a big difference but my goodness, uh, the offense popped off in this one. And the Raptors, I mean, they did well enough to score against a bad defense in Indiana. They didn't do well to defend against them. Obi Toppin just beating guys up the court, getting dunks in transition. Obi Toppin, keeper plays, dribbling directly into the paint to get dunks. It, it is what it is. They're not, they're not going to win against this Pacers team. Although I did like some of the performances and really maybe more so than any other player credit to Javon Freeman Liberty for setting the tone in this game. And I think popping off, like he had 16 points in the first half, maybe. Right. And he finishes with a career high after the game asked, you know, does that mean something to you? He finishes 20 points, eight boards, one assist, which is kind of the hang up that has been going on with Javon, I guess is like, the Raptors and the Raptors 905 trying to get him to take steps as a playmaker. And, you know, it hasn't really gone well. Certainly we don't have a lot of tape at the NBA level to say it, whether it's, you know, we've seen good stuff here or not. There's not been much, but at the 905 level as well, there's just not a lot there. And so he scored the ball and he scored it well. And he did so on difficult shots, knifing into the lane, getting to the bucket and putting the Raptors out to like an early leap. At the end of it all, though, RJ does end up leading the team in scoring. Kelly somehow gets to 22 points on seven shot attempts. He, he shot 86% from the field, 9 of 10 from, you know, the line in this game. And, and a healthy four assists, which isn't much for him these days. But, you know, that's that's just as well. We like that just fine. And Bruce Brown, that was kind of the interesting start at the beginning of this game was like the Pacers were losing. I think largely because of Tyrese Halliburton's passivity and hesitancy to dribble the ball towards the rim, just keeping things on the periphery, just keeping it on the outside, which I don't think is ever really such a good idea for NBA offense. And the Raptors on the other side have Javon punching into the lane as often as he can, getting to the bucket. Some of this like backcourt aggressiveness is paying off as well too. And, and Kelly Olenek, you know, a couple dribble drives to the rim, broken plays, get it downhill, big steps, get a bump at the end, get somebody, you know, that, that was pretty good. And, and RJ gives you a little bit there too, but, and then Bruce Brown comes off the bench and, you know, he might have a bone to pick in this game. He had 16 and five, seven of 12 from the field. He was really slick in the pick and roll. It wasn't like he got all the way to the rim every single time though. It was watching a guy get to like nine feet, 12 feet and hit these push shots and you wonder, like, because the Raptors only hit five threes in this game. They didn't take a lot. They were five of 21. Gary, as unbelievably, you know, uh, he's been a really great marksman for the Raptors over the past however many games, like the, the last m couple months. He goes 0 for 7 from downtown. Javon and Jordan Wara make up four out of the five. Like, RJ doesn't hit one. Ochai doesn't hit one. Gary doesn't hit one. Bruce, no. Jalen, no. Malik missed his 1-3. Not banging in triples. And the Pacers, I mean, they they had six, or sorry, they had 16, so they had 11 more than the Raptors. You win that by 33 points? I mean, they gum, right? It's, um, it's pretty, it's a stark difference in basketball. And the Pacers, they want to push the pace. They want to get the ball up the floor. That's what they want to be able to do. And they certainly, the Raptors did a pretty good job of stymieing that early on. You wondered when, you know, a, a, a term I hear a lot when I listen to like Blue Jays talk. And it could be whoever. It could be Julia and show, or it could be 
Kevin Barker and uh, Jeff Blair, or it could, you know, maybe Blake on the odd occasion, but show always used this worm beginning to turn. That's, that's the, the saying he uses to describe like something coming around. And so I wonder when will the worm begin to turn for Indiana? Because they, they are a much better team by the end of the game. That was really apparent. And to watch this team initially kicking and screaming and just like trying to stay afloat against the Raptors via TJ McConnell dribble drives and, you know, the short midi pull-ups. I was like, what the hell is going on here? In their starting lineup, Pascal had six points and basically nobody else had any points in the first however long of the game. I was wondering, okay, when is this going to turn on? And it did with Tyrese hit a couple threes off the bounce. It was nice to see. Credit to him. Still three for eight is a little bit tame, but he gets to the line for 10 free throw attempts in this game. And he also, he, he makes seven shots inside the arc. And some of that is in, you know, he's really great pushing the ball out to the wings, out to the corner in transition. The floor can kind of open up. We've seen that happening more and more often for point guards and lead ball handlers in transition since the advent of the Warriors and the corner triple in transition or even above the break three in transition being so dangerous. A lot more guys can walk it to the rim. I remember the watershed moment for that was in the finals. Kevin Durant ran, I think it was a three-on-one. They didn't take away the rim. He went and dunked it. I thought I was like, I th this is a huge change in basketball. This is crazy. So there was a little bit of that for Albert, but some of it is just him taking the lane that's available to him. And the Raptors, I don't think they had the facility to switch across the top of everything the, the Pacers, to their credit, are very quick at getting into the next action. Okay, move the ball out, get into something, make it work. And so they, they turned it downhill often enough. I mean, Tyrese finishes with 35-5 and five in this game. Pascal, 16-9-3. He only took 10 shots. Miles Turner, 16-4-1. He only took 10 shots. Nemhard, 8 points on 7 shots. Um, Obi Toppin at 23 points. Ben Shepard was awesome. Also got a great picture of him today. Um, he went to go dunk in the the warm-ups, and so I got a really good picture of him hanging on the rim. But he had a really great game today. On defense and on offense, a little bit, you know, 11 points on 12 shots, nothing to write home about. But you like to see some volume from him. The Pacers needed it. He had some timely threes as well. Did, did well enough for himself there. And then also on top of that, like TJ McConnell, can at times be, my God, like this the straw that stirs the drink in a way that is really, really interesting, in a way that I have a tough time comprehending because I've talked about this directly to Pacers fans, um, I guess technically Pacers personnel, and also to anybody who will listen to me talk about TJ McConnell, the way he plays basketball confounds me. It's like a witch cast a spell on him, a magic user cast a spell on him so that he was not allowed to shoot threes. And honestly, in this game, he did make his one three out of the corner, but it's just the way he pushes and drives downhill repeatedly. It's impressive, but sometimes it's just like, man, it would be a lot easier if you could just hit this shot in front of you. And and he did hit the one that he got in this game. But yeah, Obi popping off for like 23 points, six boards, two assists. It, it was a, it was a good game. Pascal even defensively got to hang around and hunt some blocks in this one, but the Raptors in this game, I think, got a really fun performance from Javon. I think they got a really gritty performance from Bruce Brown, getting into that short mid-range shot-making bag. And, you know, Jordan Cash, some, he had some shots before he had the knee buckle. And, and after the game, he told the, you know, the team, like, I'm good. But they, they obviously have to test him, see what's going on there. I thought Kelly played awesome. You know, not defensively. The boards are always a problem for this team. They will forever be a problem for this team until more of the size introduce reintroduces itself to the lineup. And, you know, Ochai, we have a listener question that we'll get to for that. But RJ kind of pushing for half-court creation throughout the game, waiting patiently for driving lanes to open up and see if he can work his way in and worm to the bucket. And he did on occasion thunderous punch of a dunk towards the end of the game there but yeah um we'll focus on ochai he was 0 for 6 in this game 0 for 2 from 3 left a couple layups on the rim from trash clips we have quote 
Ochai was shooting 40% from three in his last year at Kansas. Do you think he's having mechanics issues or is he just not good enough up against NBA defenders? End quote. Okay, so Darko was asked this question in the press conference afterwards, and he said that Ochai's shot looks really good in practice and that they're trying to like work it up to game speed. Now, when he came out of the draft, Ochai was one of the most accomplished amateur shooters in the world. He was banging triples at Kansas. I, in my untrained eye, or trained only in so far as people know me as an analyst, whether you think I'm good or bad, you know, put your stock where you where you want. I see his jumper as kind of inconsistent in its motion, in its repeatability, and also in the arc that he shoots the ball at. That's a lot of variables that he has to correct. The thing like with Scotty, who the arc on his jumper can change quite rapidly. The thing with him is like, even if he has a really, he has a knack of just getting the ball close. And and we see that manifest in his touch around the rim where he's a fantastic finisher, his hook shots, the mid range, like he, he's been able to get his shooting to, you know, a very respectable place, even as it dipped towards the end of the season. And Ochai when there's so many things going wrong on a given shot that can go sideways, it's kind of tough to achieve the consistency, especially from a catch and shoot perspective, because it's not like he has pop off the bounce that he's going to like use the threat of a pull-up jumper, which pull-up jumpers are more inconsistent and you have to hit them less often because teams respond to like 31, 32, 33% pull-up jumpers as if there's somebody they need to worry about. You know, Fred, Fred Van Vliet is a great case study for this. He, he's hung around like 32, 33, 34% and teams still that that pull up jumper is pretty uncomfortable for them for teams for defenses to allow. And Ochai is just a guy we're looking at from a catch and shoot, shoot perspective. He doesn't have it, man. He just has not shot the ball well at all. And it is pretty disheartening because that's what you saw some of the defense and you wonder like, this should be able to track. And I know somebody asked about or had commented that um, uh, they asked, uh, how, how do you analyze like Ochai as um, as a defender when the team defense isn't very good? And like my answer for that, and there's actually a, a, a chat, a, a chatter just popped up asking some th- something similar. Um, how do you how do you like pay attention to that kind of stuff? And mostly what I'm paying attention for Ochai is like how he keeps his um his man in front of him, screen navigation, how he shades to his help, and, and also some of the responsibilities he has as a low man, some of the responsibilities as he has in gap help. You can notice those things even in bad defenses. So there's always stuff to look for. You know, it's like Emmanuel quickly played on a very good defense in New York. And so people thought that his defense was a lot more infallible than it actually was. And so what that meant was that when he came over to Toronto, there were more holes in his defense than initially expected because everybody was, you know, everybody was kind of like a team defense can paper over sink like the individual mistakes, that kind of stuff, you know. And so you can notice like Ochai has great footwork around screens. Like he can wiggle across the top and stay connected or he can stab step around for a lock and trail. He can keep guys in front of him fairly well. And so all those things are like great indicators for defense. It's just if you can't hit a shot and you have no off the dribble juice and you're not like a really strong finisher and you're undersized on offense, how are you going to make sure that like the coach wants to keep you on the floor? And he's gotten run, man. Like, Ochai has really gotten run, continues to get run, and just nothing is popping off, right? And so we like he shot like at 22% from three as a Raptor. 22%. He shot like what, like 38% overall as a Raptor. This is really bad stuff. Um, Mauricio Arena says, How can you act how can you analyze a professional basketball team when there's no priority to defend 140 points? Unacceptable, intolerable. I mean it's my job and it's also the coaching staff's job and it's also the other team's job like the raptors still get scouted the pacers still get scouted the pacers have allowed a lot of points this year they still win games like they're playing basketball for 48 minutes there's stuff to analyze there's stuff to talk about which we've been doing for i guess 15 minutes so far it's that's 
for people who want the broad strokes, the easy stuff, the Raptors aren't good. We, I've been repeating this. I think many people have been repeating this for, for quite some time, but the Raptors aren't good. And if you want the broad strokes wins, maybe you can look at, you know, our RJ Barrett, for example, being really efficient as he scores. But then somebody, and it happens quite often, you can highlight what RJ is doing better. You can highlight where he's made steps statistically. You can highlight that this is by far the best stretch of his career. Somebody would say, well, the team's not winning. It's empty stats. It's meaningless. So if you let people do it, people can minimize and corner you into a space where it's like, don't talk about the team unless they're good. And I know that's not what you're doing, Mauricio, but like you... There's 48 minutes of basketball every time they play. They got three games left. We got, you know, we got 144 minutes left. A sprint until this thing is over, you know. You also add, Mauricio Arena says, DFA every scrub, G League players, including Ochai, Wara, Kelly, bunch of bums. <laughs> um, Kelly signed that extension, so definitely not him. But And Ochai will have one more year at the very least. Um, now, I can't, I can't speak to the like how much Masai likes Ochai, but he did like him enough to target him in a trade. He probably likes him more than I do as a player. And Wara, I think his return to the Raptors next season is dependent on, you know, what happens with Gary or the Raptors have a bag to throw at not Malik Williams, but another Malik, a monk. You know, uh, I guess we'll see what happens. But I think War is a guy who probably is on the back burner. And yeah, and Kelly will be around. Um, uh, it's uh, Jay, Kennedy, Jay Kennedy Carter says, no, Caitlin, question mark. I'm, I got, it's because the Raptors, like the last time we did it, it was in Indiana. The game before that, it was in Toronto, but I was in Mexico. We're able to do the podcast right after the game. It's really late right now. It's midnight. And so this was the the one podcast where um, that Caitlin and I can't do it. But we will be doing lots of stuff together in the short term future. But yeah, just it's midnight. Caitlin, not everybody wants to podcast at midnight with me. You know, it's ridiculous that I'm here anyways. Right. It's um, and thank you to everybody for tuning in and listening at this point, because, it you know, it's late hoop stock. And especially with me, not necessarily the broad strokes. It can be. You know, niche can be all that kind of stuff. Speaking of, um, Coco says Samson and Javon film session when. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if Javon, what happens with him over the course of the summer and all that kind of stuff. But I wonder if I might be able to set something up for Summer League. That might be interesting. Although it, nothing is really set in stone with this roster. There's a lot of stuff that could move, a lot of stuff that could shake between, you know, the draft, the draft lottery. Even Bruce Brown, a guy who's on the docket for like 22 million or 21 million, I can't remember. Like he might not, he could just not have his contract renewed. They could just say the team option, no. Or they might be able to find like a, uh, let's say like a, a contender that flamed out or needed a guy like Bruce in the rotation during the play, the upcoming playoffs. And they might be able to say like, ooh, well, you know, we're, we're looking at, we can't really add a guy like Bruce as far as in free agency. We're not going to see him there or we want to make sure we can get him and we want to use the cap space that we don't have to trade format like the draft. Like you can do something like that, although we don't really know what's going to happen with that. We don't really know. There's a lot of variables that can just change. And like that's that's the thing, like Mauricio I don't necessarily agree with the framing. Like, obviously, we're a little bit different in that sense. Uh, you know, the bums talk and all that kind of stuff. But you're correct to identify that, like, the Raptors aren't married to many players on the roster right now. And the roster is comprised of many players who may very well move on, be traded, all this kind of stuff, because the Raptors this season are a very bad team. Very bad. Not good. You're not supposed to be married to players that play bad basketball or you don't think have the ability to like have a big ceiling in the long term or provide impact in the short term and so kelly would be an example of a guy who there isn't ceiling long term but there's impact in the short term and he helps facilitate the type of basketball that the raptors want to play there's value there he's also 
a really well liked player, that kind of stuff. A guy like, for example, Grady, impact in the gutter. They're losing his minutes. He's 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 losing a lot of stuff defensively. He's not yet consistent enough offensively and has been like overtaxed with what he needs to do. So he's in the short term is like the impact terrible. But long term, for me, I can really see it. I can see, you know, the roots of Grady's game. I can see that there's there's a really good player there. So it's worth it. A lot of these guys for the fan and for the front office, a lot of the players on the Raptors are probably not able to find themselves in either of those camps. And so that creates a roster that may have a lot of turnover. And some guys may dodge that. Jalen McDaniels, just because that extra year of four million, he might be able to like dodge the because there isn't ceiling there and there isn't short term impact there. He might get, you know, he might get away with it. But not everyone on the you know the team will not everybody that won't be the case for everybody we'll we'll see a lot of roster changes but we got three more games we we got some minutes before we get there so i guess we'll see by the way did i say 144 it'd be 100 and, it'd be 132 wait what the hell am i talking about it'd be 144 yeah what why did i start thinking that anyway so we have some games left. Also at the top, um, Nesta said, seeing Williams rolling in the paint wearing number 35 just hurts with how Coloco ended up. This season has been rough on so many levels. The future can only be brighter than this, y'all. I mean, man, isn't that the truth? You have, like, Pascal Siakam, people will probably, like, some people would fight tooth and nail for him to be a franchise legend, and some people will fight tooth and nail for him to not be considered one, right? That's, but he's in the conversation. He's, he's a, like a monumental figure in the franchise. I think OG Ananobi, while not quite the same level, huge Fred, huge Fred left before the season. OG and Pascal left during the season. The team has radically changed. It got so much worse. All of that stuff happened. Okay. John Tay Porter is still being investigated for illegally betting on his own games or sorry, like fucking around with the bets around his own games. That's what he's being investigated for. You know, Christian Coloco has a unique health situation that not only puts him in a difficult position with his NBA career, but puts like his life in like a a difficult position to some degree. And he, I thought Christian was great. There's a reason I want, that's a reason last year I want to sit down with him because he was really interesting on defense. I want to watch film with him. I wanted to learn what he was thinking. So we did. I liked his game a lot. That happened. We got a million different things going on. We got Scotty left the court. And then they said they talked to him about it. And then Scotty said they didn't talk to me about it. And then it was just like murky, murky stuff going on. Half the fan base hates the coach. All this kind of stuff. It, I mean, it's just, it has been, I speak of, like we were walking out of the media section after the game today and these little kids, they started heckling Darko. They said, nice win, coach Darko. They're heckling him. I couldn't believe it. I mean, like, it's funny. It's, it's harmless, right? Um, but yeah, it's not been a successful year. They raised the ticket prices in spite of all this. They said, you'll pay more. What are we thinking? It, it's been tough, man. Tough season. Uh, Coco says, all the beloved's gone. Yeah. Phoenix Plays E says, speaking of OG, how much do you think he would have taken the load off of Kawhi if he didn't have to get that appendix surgery? Oh, I mean, OG was maybe marginally more dependable than Norman Powell. And Norm got run. And Fred got run when Fred was playing terribly, but it could have happened quite easily that OG would have like fallen out of the rotation that year. The Raptors were stupid deep, really stupid deep. And if OG just wasn't like really on one, it might not really have have been there. And as far as like, I don't know, taking the load off of Kawhi in the playoff run, I mean, hypothetically, yes, some, but. OG would have had to be leapfrogging a lot of guys. 
like a lot of guys that he might not have been ready to leapfrog at, at that point in time. Of course, he had a great year the next year. I loved watching OG that year, but the the seas kind of parted for him to assume the role, the, the Kawhi role. He he and Pascal kind of split it, and what is it? There was like it's that Moneyball thing. We'll recreate him in the aggregate that type of year. Um, Finish plays. He says his rookie year he was phenomenal, regardless of that Lebronto series. Yeah, but different different formation of a team as well. But yeah, I just think like there's a. Was he going to leapfrog Surge? Probably not. Was he going to leapfrog Norm? Yes, in some lineups. Was he going to leapfrog Fred? Maybe in some lineups. But he's he wasn't leapfrogging Danny. He, he definitely wasn't leapfrogging anybody in the starting five. It's just like, even if he was healthy, which I wish he was, it would have been interesting to see what type of play he got. Because as good as he was in the LeBronto series or the playoffs going up to that, and OG has always been fantastic, he's still, you know, as far as like what type of run he would get. Fred and Norm had inconsistent run in the playoffs, uh, in the run up to the the finals. Like people, people don't pay me maybe give it that much mind that like Fred was so atrocious that the fact that he was playing in the Bucks series was like a shock. Because the way he played in that in that Philly series was insanely bad. Like he couldn't do anything in that Philly series, man. And Norm had a lot of trouble too. So it might have been helpful to go to like OG then. But then can OG explode the way that Fred exploded? Like it's just yeah. And he, he wouldn't play over Surge either. Like it'd be pretty difficult for Nick to make that call, I reckon, at that point in time. But yeah. Um Phoenix plays. He says, "I don't know if you remember the game at Oracle in December 2019, where we blew the doors off of Golden State Warriors on the back-to-back -back without Ka Kawhi. The game where Jonas got injured. OG, Danny were awesome. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't consider regular season games a bell, a really great bellwether for like playoff, um, playoff match matchups, though necessarily. Teams they keep so much under lock and key, and like regular season basketball, which I love." And I hate when people devalue regular season basketball because every regular season game has a physical toll. Players put their bodies on the line every game. So I don't like devaluing it. I like enjoying the regular season for what it is, which is a little bit different than playoff basketball and especially attention to detail in the matchups and especially OG, who was fairly one note at that point in time. Uh, it, it He might have not been as matchup proof, but. I, like OG is one of my favorite players ever, ever, ever. So, you know, but Phoenix plays East is having a player for Kevin Durant would have been good, but Kevin Durant didn't play that much at all. He played what, like three quarters. Unfortunately, it would have been cool to see them go head to head. I don't know if the Raptors win if KD is healthy, but then again, like KD came into that game shooting hundred percent. He had every shot and that wouldn't have sustained, but yeah. Um, MJ Barrow says, I don't know a lot about coaching, but I like Darko. I like seeing him take, Talk, talking to the players on the sidelines. I remember him kneeling in front of a sitting and defeated GTJ after a bad run and lifting him up. Yeah, that was the question I asked Darko uh, last game because there was a, I noticed that Darko was trying to call a play and then quickly was trying to run a play. And then Gary was stuck in the corner and Gary wasn't doing anything. And everybody responded like Gary did the wrong thing. And then Emmanuel just ran a, regular like cross screen pick and roll and went to the free throw line and Gary came over to Darko and Darko give him a pep talk give him a slap on the ass get him out of here and then so I asked him like what were you guys talking about and they were just talking about like matchups they're trying to identify and that kind of stuff Darko is well liked and I think that he is able to convey that kind of stuff that was the question I asked them before the game too and they don't public they don't publicize the pregame stuff anymore i don't think i i don't see it posted on the raptors youtube channel or anything like that but um i asked darko if you play more basketball as an assistant coach or as a head coach and he said you play more as an assistant coach and that like when he first started playing basketball in the nba when he was with the spurs as an assistant um another guy came up to him and said like you gotta like keep yourself in shape you gonna need new shoes. Like you need to be able to defend in these actions and kind of like move through all this kind of stuff. And so 
you know, he went through a bit of a metamorphosis as a guy who helped players while being out there on the court. And he said he was really excited for the summer where he gets to do a lot of camps and he gets to do like a lot of international basketball stuff where he gets to go and, you know, run through a lot of drills and get out and like start doing screening, hitting guys with passes, really being on the court and working on that kind of stuff. He mentioned that there's a lot less of that as a head coach because of all the additional things you have to to worry about and plan for and game planning and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I like Darko. I'm, I know a lot of people are thinking in terms of wins and losses and I know people see some ugly scores, but man, I think it is a coach's job to facilitate the roster that he or she has like a really, really, that's what I think about. And I think rosters win games more than anything. And it's a really special coach to be able to override roster and to do something where like you're greater than the sum of your parts. And Darko has not made the Raptors greater than the sum of their parts. I don't think that's um, been the case whatsoever. But I think that's for mid-tier teams that become good teams. And I think that's good teams that become great teams. As far as like one of the worst teams in the league, I mean, it's tough to just coach them so that they're good and better. G League talent beats NBA talent all of a sudden because the coach is good. It's like, no. If G League talent is beating NBA talent, you know what that means? It doesn't mean the coach is good. It means whoever that G League player is, they need to be in the NBA. Like That's what that means. Coaches sometimes get way too much credit. And I always, I always said this about Nick. I thought Nick got way too much credit for a lot of stuff that Raptors players were doing. And then coaches get way too much like shit when things aren't going well, I find. Because I just, it's easy to over index on coaches and people do it, but it's like a face. It's like, you can really like, you see that man, you're like, you make the decisions, listen here, make better decisions. And you, if you've had, you ask like many people to explain why they think the coach is bad. If somebody's really into the weeds, they'll probably give you like lineup data and say like, oh, they need to be playing like X and Y lineups because they're like a plus six over like 212 possessions or something. Okay, you can make that argument, certainly. I've heard those arguments made and those argu arguments have worked. Like sometimes it is playing the right lineup. Sometimes they're just like, well, the team's losing and they don't play good defense. Why doesn't he make them play good defense? It's like, I don't know, dog. He's not out on the court. I see what scheme they're playing. You can't you can't yell at guys until they're good at defense when they're G League players or like all of them below average players over the course of like four and seven and 11 years in the NBA. You can't just yell guys into good defense. You know, it's tough. Um, and then like some could be if you're really into the weeds, like I had a really awesome um, conversation with. A guy, his his name is Bowser to Bowser. He's like a really great X's and O's guy on Twitter, and now does a podcast um, with with Emmanuel Gualberto where they break down game film and all that kind of stuff, which I think is like a really great resource. And the first episode was great, and I'm looking forward to more. But um, it's called Ready to Diagram, by the way, and he was talking about very specific actions, and we were talking about like. The Raptors running more pick and roll with Pascal Siakam, but then he was talking about like, well, if Pascal's here, you know, who is the big and do you have a big man who can draw the tag? Because if you want to run blade action out of the corner, you have to draw a tag. And if you don't draw a tag, well, then blade action won't work because they'll just switch across it. Like you can get super, super specific. That's like 0.5% of the population that watches basketball could get super specific in that way. But mostly coach critiques are like, Fairly blase. And that doesn't mean they're wrong necessarily. It just doesn't, it just means you're probably not close to the truth of the matter, even if you end up with the right answer. And that's so much of life, right? Like you with vaccines, for example. I do I took the vaccines, and you know why? Because I believed in the authority of the situation and doctors who told me I should take the vaccine. I surrendered myself to it. I said, I'm sure you know more. And so my baseline became like, I took the vaccine. The vaccine is the thing to take. I'm not going to, what am I, an immunologist? 
I can't get to that point and figure it out. All that kind of stuff. When the eclipse happened, they told us the minute the eclipse was going to happen. They told us the minute it was going to happen. They studied that. They knew it. And they were right. I believed them. I walked out at like 3.15 to sit there because they said at 3.18 or 3.19, that was the to like 99.8% totality. And they were right. I didn't go and figure it out on my own. I just trusted it. You know, we have to trust some things. Trusting institutions can be, is an important thing. You know, having conspiracy brain is maybe not the, it's not of much utility in this world. And my point being in all of that, I have some good educated guesses and a good analytical eye for a lot of what, you know, NBA teams are doing. And I still can't capture the totality of what the hell, you know, a coaching staff is doing all the time. So coaching critiques are like there. Finding coaching answers is really, really hard. Like if you were there on the sideline, you're watching your team get blown the hell out. Somebody says, how do you make this work? And you see a guy playing defense and he's losing his matchup. And you look around and you don't see anybody who can win that matchup. And then you say, okay, we're going to double. We're going to send a blitz to that matchup. But they have another player who, who flashes middle and play makes great against four on three situations. You say, well, we, we don't have it. We're going to have to make up for it elsewhere. We're going to have to try and score 123 points and hope they don't score 140. It's tough, man. It's tough. And, of course, there are, there are better coaches in the NBA than Darko. Darko... You know, he uh, like he, he he says he has lots to learn and he certainly does. First year rookie, all that kind of stuff. And um, other coaches would find answers earlier, would find answers, you know, before they go back to the tape. All that kind of stuff for the next day. You know, some coaches are better at that. Some coaches are better at unlocking like a certain play style. That's kind of what Nick Nurse is known for, right? They, he wanted to like add super juice to what Embiid was doing, and Embiid certainly had it. Crazy, crazy year for Embiid um, until he got injured, but now he's back. All that kind of stuff. Derek K says, "Were you confused with how Darko played Boucher?" Yes, I was. Um, I talked about that quite a bit at the time before Boucher got injured, but it seemed like the Raptors. Um, Darko is a member of the Raptors decision makers. He pulls the lever, but there's someone who is telling him what lever should be pulled. You know, sometimes front office has explicit directions for a coach. Sometimes that kind of stuff happens. Now, this isn't me reporting, but based on how NBA franchises move, I suspect that the Boucher thing was a directive and something that top down the franchise thought was what they were supposed to be doing. And I don't think that was just Darko saying like, mm, can't find space for Boucher. That's, that's my thoughts on it. So <laughs> Phoenix plays. He says, are you saying the head coach is a puppet? No. <laughs> one thing, one thing like Darko does like, this isn't Masai's offense that's being run. Darko designed the offense, right? We all see that Darko instilled change that was radical and much different than the style the Raptors played last year. The two styles could not be more different. That's all Darko. Players aren't puppets for the coach. The coach isn't puppets for the front office. I'm saying in this one specific thing, you the front office is asking to be in lockstep on a decision with a player. You know, like it's... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Phoenix plays. He was joking. But, it, you know, for there's probably somebody listening who thought the same thing. So even you asking me that, it elicits a response that, you know, maybe is food for thought for somebody. Um, so basically, the head coach is just, it's not a puppet. You know, and I know you're kidding, Phoenix, but um, it's just like, that's, that's what they talked about with the Blue Jays last year, right? Was that the Blue Jays had a game plan from their very high level decision makers their analytics team and the manager, they all coalesced into like, okay, 
Jose Barrios is leaving the game at this point in time because this is the game plan or whatever. Like, and everybody agreed on that. And Schneider had to pull Barrios, so it looks really bad for him. But the the consensus was like, Schneider was not just out there like, nah, screw him, I'm pulling the pitcher. Like it was, there's top down decision make decisions, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, all that, all that good stuff, all the politics. But I, Chris Boucher, when the Raptors are trying to lose games, he's too impactful. Like we saw it. The Raptors have successfully tanked themselves past a couple teams. They tanked past a couple teams. They really did. They figured it out. They lost games and they stand. They have better draft position because of it. I guess we'll see what happens with the lottery. You know, I just looking at the way that things played out, the amount of rest time, the amount of like somebody's sore. So they're sitting, you know, the fact that Chris Boucher was not getting that much play. And every time he entered a game, you'd see direct impact. You'd be like, he's giving it his all, man. You know, Phoenix plays. He says Boucher is a freaking winner. You don't play NBA talent when you tank. I will never question his effort. Yeah, like I concur. Boucher is a freaking winner. That guy wins everywhere he goes for the most part. Maybe not as much with um with this recent iteration of the Raptors, but Chris he he kills himself out on the floor, man. He gives his he gives his body to the game. He gives his life to the game. It's commendable, but it makes it harder to tank. Um, Coco says, when is the lottery? May 7th, I believe. MJ Barrow says May, but I think May 7th specifically. Or maybe May 7th or May 27th, I think. I can't remember what I saw when I Googled it. Um, Rahul Coley says, um, all this tanking to only have a 45% chance at keeping their pick. I know they didn't want to, but injuries cho chose them to choose or made them choose a direction. Yep. I, th I think that's true. Injuries definitely, like, it was a conversation. Keep or convey was a really big conversation. And I was initially, um, like, a convey guy because, you know, as much as I push back on the, like, terrible draft stuff, it's like, well, a lot of the scouts I like and know tell me 2025 should be pretty gnarly as a draft. And if the Raptors, like they, they looked okay with Scotty leading the charge. If they, if they make a run at the play in, then like, so be it. You kind of run it like that. But the Raptors, like injuries chose this direction, but they leaned even harder into it, I think is kind of what I'd like to say about that. But yeah, you're definitely onto something, Rahul. Um, and yeah, like 45% is not a great shot at keeping it, but I mean, they put themselves in this position. Even if even if they played, you know, everybody all the time, they still have their injuries that they get. Yeah, I mean, what are they like? Eighth or seventh instead of sixth? We're splitting hairs, really, you know. Um, Phoenix says, Samson plays a bet on who's going to rep us at the lottery. A front office member coach, or do you think it ends up being one of our players? I feel like it'll be Scotty. Like the NBA loves having Scotty at stuff. They really like having Scotty at stuff. And Scotty is like, he's a showman big time. He's a very entertaining young man. And the NBA likes him. They've brought him to stuff before. There's a lot of stuff like that. I feel like it could be Scotty who goes there. He's, he's kind of like a, he's like an instant vibes guy, right? You can see him on the bench all the time. He shows up to places, big smile, big kid goofy guy always capable of making people laugh like he's a big personality i wonder i wonder if it's scotty but yeah i think that's probably where i'll leave it um solar tier says 50 watching hit the like yeah a late a late night uh podcast i don't know when the next one of these will be there will be a handsome amount of podcasts in the run-up to draft lottery and draft and off-season stuff where we'll talk about like a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, look forward to more of that. And like a lot of written stuff um, in the, 
the aftermath of the season where we'll be doing like grades for players and all that, all that good stuff. And then breakdowns, video breakdowns, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, stay tuned. Like the video before you get out of here. Subscribe if you feel so inclined. And yeah, I'll see y'all. Okay. Raptors lose. Tough one. Um, yeah, that's where we're at. Okay. Well, they got into this in the morning or at night. Have a blessed day and goodbye.